This is episode number two. Episode two. Okay. That's we made cool. it. We made it. And so today, we're talking about Vampire's Kiss. The name of the show is... Cage. I could discuss Cage for hours. And so the first thing we're going to talk about today, we're talking about the film Vampire's Kiss. But the first thing we're going to do is get a synopsis from Sean about the film. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, the synopsis, Vampire's Kiss is about Peter Lowe, a literary agent who uh, goes out one night. He's got his career under wraps, looking good, feeling great about that, very uh, confident about that. Goes out looking for maybe the missing piece in his life, which is a girl. He's out at a bar, meets what he thinks is his dream girl, takes her back to his place, uh, and gets a little bit more than he thought from her. She then bites him like a vampire. And uh, for the rest of the film, he basically starts this descent into vampirism. He becomes, you know, convinced that he's a vampire and just kind of spirals out of control as the film goes on, I would say. All right. Well, I just watched this film. Uh, I hadn't maybe never seen it or it's been a long time if I had. And it's odd. No doubt about it. Um, but Nick says that he this is one of the, his own films that he can watch, even though it's been many decades at this point, that he actually enjoys watching it. Why do you think that is? I, I'm imagining it's because it's so odd, to your point, that, you know, it's like, why would he want to watch more of his sort of pedestrian efforts, movie-wise, right? Not necessarily his performance pedestrian, but... This movie is so bizarre, and his performance is so interesting that I bet it's more interesting for him to watch and kind of like laugh about. You know, like, look at this, this young version of me. I was like really going for it here. It's goofy, but it kind of works, you know? And it's, I think it's caught on now, and so maybe there's like something where he feels like there's more of a community out there for this film now than there ever was before. So maybe that makes it easier to watch too. Um, yeah, and speaking of, because it was considered a flop at the time of its release, but over time it's become a bit of a cult classic. Um, and what do you, what uh, does the film have that you think that makes, that makes that possible for it to be like a cult classic after all these years? I mean, I would assume that part of the reason it sort of became that is, it was like 10 years, 11 years ago now, there was this kind of famous video that got put on the internet and YouTube called Nick Cage is Losing His Shit. I think it's been titled a couple different things, but basically somebody just edited together a compilation. Maybe I talked about it briefly in the last um, interview, but it, you know, it's just all of these crazy moments, and there are a lot of moments from this film. I think people, um, probably like myself, were like, oh, what's that? I haven't seen that. You know, It had always been on my list, but I hadn't seen it. There were probably like 10 of his films that I hadn't caught, and this was one of them, because it was harder to find at the time. Uh, so when I finally found it, you know, I really appreciated how just odd it is. But at the same time, part of the reason I really like it is it does, if you're a fan anyway, I feel like it really shows you that he's been doing the same kind of acting his whole career. Like, this is the movie to me where if you look back on his career, he really kind of shoots for the moon and does what a lot of us kind of see him doing more often now in films. Um, so I don't know, I think that cult status kind of came from that and a younger generation just sort of maybe getting it more, maybe finding the humor in it more, because it's a dark story, but it's funny, you know, and it's just so odd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a descriptive term to describe his voice or his manner of speaking. Um, is it better or worse than Charlie in Peggy Sue Got Married? I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, or what does he sound like? It's probably less uh, irritating, right, than Peggy Sue Got Married to most people. I mean, that definitely was a choice, right? And nobody liked that uh, except him and his uncle who made that film, right? Who and He almost got fired. The studio wanted him fired. His co-star wanted him fired and Peggy Sue Got Married. But Francis Ford Coppola went to bat for him. Um, and it's a very strange voice. This voice, I think, fits the character. I don't know if you noticed, but there are times in the movie where he doesn't have it quite as 
Have you did you notice that? So like when he's talking to the therapist, it's not there as much, and there's a couple other times where it's not there as much. But like it's a weird sort of English wannabe kind of accent, right? It's not quite English, but it's like as if you or I were you know living in England suddenly, and we just sort of adopted an accent like that. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Right. And it does also, as as you said. It kind of turns on and off sometimes where you're sort of like, oh, it's back. Right, oh, and then it right. kind of, may, sometimes it'll fade away but, and then it'll come back. But I think that was intentional. I mean, as far as I, I, I know, I think that what he want, or what they were trying to do is like show that he was putting on this, you know, performance essentially for a certain crowd of people and the character was in the film. So uh, it works. I did read um, that his main inspiration for The Voice, did you read about this? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, was actually his father. Oh. So his father was uh, in the literary world. He was a professor and at some point, apparently to like kind of help himself feel more acclimated to that environment that he was working in, kind of he, Cage always talked about him taking on that sort of a little bit different accent than he had growing up, you know, yeah. it's kind of interesting, so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So the movie has fake bats, although they wanted real bats, and it has real cockroaches, and it has real pigeons. My que that's, that's a comment more than a question, but my question <laughs> is, is eating cockroaches, how bold are we? Would you do it? Wow. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that I would. A cockroach, it's funny. To me, my first question would be, am I going to die from eating a cockroach, right? Probably not, but I would be a little concerned about that. Um, and so that wasn't in the script. I remember reading this a long time ago. Like That wasn't in the script. Um, it was something he really wanted to do. The director completely supported it. Uh, and so he was like, yeah, let's, let's go for it. So they did it on the take. Cage, I think, talked about it being, I wanted to consume something that would scare me. And that was something that scared him. So I, I actually uh, listened to the commentary. And in the commentary, the director says that they, he actually made Nick Cage do it twice as payback for uh, there's a scene that happened prior to that in the movie where he's standing still and ripping up paper and the director wanted Nick Cage to like be more you know have more movement with that scene <laughs> and he was like no I this is how it needs to be done I would be standing very still ripping this paper up and the director was like okay I'll let you have this one kind of thing but then when they did the cockroach scene he made him do he the first take is the one that's in the movie apparently but the second take was more for just you know kind of his payback but yeah he ate that cockroach because he felt like the character should be doing something, you know, grotesque. At that point in the film, he's just like really spiraled out of control. He's just become this insane person. You know, he's acting like he's a vampire, right? He's like starting to wear shades because the sun is kind of affecting <laughs> him. He's, he's like hunched over. It's like, you know, he's becoming animalistic, right? It's yeah. interesting, so. Well, and apparently they, he wanted, Nick wanted a real bat. Oh, right. It's, you know, for authenticity, et cetera, but I guess maybe, I'm sure locating a bat and then having the bat do exactly what you need it to yeah. do while the camera's That's rolling right. is probably another story Very altogether. Difficult. Yeah. Very difficult to do. Well, it's funny, I think that the bat, I mean, you know, the bat for me works. It's not even in the film that much. It's funny to me that somebody would, you know, like to make my performance better, really need that bat, but it works well the way it is. And the pigeons were drugged, I think, in that scene, I read. Um, because I don't think you can. Can you catch a pigeon? No, no they're pretty right? fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I heard they were like drugged. Yeah. But these are all things, of course, that you would never do in right. the modern right. era. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But back then, you could maybe. Yeah, eighty-seven in. was right when it came out, yeah. or was it eighty-eight. Yeah. yeah. People now would be a little. Yeah, for sure. You did what to the pigeons? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things I like about the film, <laughs> the film progresses. Um, is that law gets crazier and crazier and more demented, right? Um, the vampire on the streets is one of my, those scenes that continue on the fold is one of my favorite things about the film. It's just wild. And I wanted to know, like, what was your impression of, of, of that comment of getting crazier and crazier and also these scenes on the street where the vampire is roaming. I love those scenes. This is very difficult to talk. I love it. Um, I love those scenes because I feel like if you're walking down the street, you could see, you know, people are 
unfortunately are in that situation today, right? And so it's not out of the realm of possibility to see somebody acting like that, right? But for this movie character to kind of go down this mad descent is very comical, I think, because it's so out there, but it really fits this character's journey. Yeah. You know, at that point in the film, it's toward the end, and he's like on his way back home when the sun's coming up in the morning, right? And <laughs> he's just yelling and talking to a imaginary, uh, a perfect wife, right? Perfect girlfriend at first, right? Those are the scenes you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just so mad. Uh-huh. It's everything that he's doing. Yeah. He's talking to the therapist when he's talking to the wall. Uh-huh. That's all that stuff is, is crazy. I do I do know that when they shot a lot of that stuff, it was uh, with a long lens. And so they captured it, you know, far away. And a lot of the people didn't know they were, uh-huh. like, they were, they were making a film. And so there's a couple that, uh, when he's got that wood stake thing, you know? And he kind of walks close to them, and they like, you know, those people are actually homeless people uh-huh. who didn't want him. You know, they're like, hey, hey, calm down, calm down, kind of thing. So, I mean, he looks insane, dude. His suit is all messed up. He's carrying that wood stake around. He's acting like, you know, Nick Cage, and it's just wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> we did it. We did one question with him in. Um, it's hard to talk. Also, you'll hear that the, uh, we're in Los Angeles, and so there's always someone doing their yard. Uh, so you hear the blower in the background. They're very saliva now, I might mm-hmm. add. They capture mm-hmm. a lot of saliva. But yeah, just anyone who would be walking down the street in that attire that's uh, covered with blood, and then to yeah. cap it off, uh, carrying a part of a pallet that more or less looks like a giant steak. <laughs> yeah. It's going to capture a lot of attention, and, and I think it did. Um, so this is a question I asked. I mean, we've only done two of these, but it, this is again. I know this. It, it's the second time I've asked it. Um, because of the latter day resurgence of this film, um, and it's fueled this debate whether or not Nick Cage is a good actor or not. I believe that he is. Uh, of course, I agree with that. Yes. yes. Okay. So I think this film is kind of what I was saying about part of why I think it's a cult film, or when you ask that question, I think part of the reason that it's, I don't know, I, hopefully I want to believe that it's turned people into believing that he's a good actor, because if you look at it, you have to at the very least acknowledge that it's interesting, right? It's not something that you're used to. So he came up in acting when, you know, like naturalism was a big thing, right? Obviously there was that whole method acting style, but that kind of you know, turned into more naturalism. But the method is not quite naturalism, but it's also not quite like as expressionistic as Nick Cage likes to say his sort of acting is. And so this movie, when you're watching it, there's even a sequence where on the TV they're watching Nosferatu. And obviously Nosferatu was a a clear uh, connection with Nick Cage growing up himself. He's always talked about that and uh, the, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Those are like two films that he loves. And so when you see that in this film, the tiny clip that you see, and if you've not seen Nosferatu, I highly recommend it. I believe it's streaming on YouTube. Uh, So if you don't have it, you can watch it there. It's great. It's really, really worth it. Um, His performance is very similar to to those characters in that film. It's got that silent era kind of expressionistic thing, right? There's that famous meme-worthy thing, and it took off as a meme where he's like, his eyes are really... Up like that, and he's looking at Alva, his uh, his uh, Maria Cachito Alonso, his like clerk, who the whole film he's writing her hard to to find this file. Um, it's incredible, dude. It, like it, when you look at it from that perspective, like what he was doing and how out of the box it was. I think that that's what makes him an interesting actor and what makes him a good actor. I, you know, you were saying it bombed. It totally bombed. Nobody got it. Everybody was talking about how, you know, Cage is at fault because he was like, what is this performance? And the director's at fault because he didn't reign in the star. But the one person, apparently, who liked the film um, was Pauline Kael, who's a legendary film reviewer, right? Um, She's been around for a long, long time. She wrote for The New Yorker, I think. I can't remember, but I think The New Yorker. And so she she was a legendary critic. She was the only one. She came out saying at the time that... um, something about how she connected it to that old silent era movie star acting and she was like this is really interesting you know maybe the movie's not great but like what he's doing here is really interesting and i think that's why some of his peers talk about him being a really great actor and somebody who's doing something interesting with the 
you know, the, the, the art form, right? Because most people are more like naturalistic acting and most people say, well, this is over the top acting, but you know, sure, you could look back at old silent films and say that that's over the top acting to us, you know, same thing with like 30s films, 40s films, right? The way that that dialogue, you know, it's just the way things kind of go. So for him to kind of harken back to the old style of acting, you know, in an era where that was not a thing is brave, I think, and interesting. and. Then he kind of plugs this sort of style that he has into bigger films, you know, like Face Off, right? He talks about Face Off being another film of his that he loves and like the same kind of wild behavior is in that. And But it works, you know, I think it works yeah. really well. It's worked really well for him, in my opinion. Yeah. So, so yes, good yeah. actor. Good actor. Um, so apparently he wasn't, he was paid $40,000, not much, a very reduced fee. It was a very low, low budget film. Uh, and he bought a car. Do you happen to know what car it is, by any chance? I do. And does he still have it? Uh, it's a Stingray Corvette. Right. And I don't know if he still has it. Yeah. I'd be curious, actually, if he still has it. He loves cars. So I met one time Vincent Gallo. Did I tell you the story? Mm -hmm. So I met Vincent Gallo here in Los Angeles. Uh, it was very nice to me. And we were chatting about a bunch of different stuff. Nick Cage came up, as it does in a lot of my conversations. <laughs> and Vincent Gallo kn said he knew him and had hung out a lot with him. And so he told this great story about how they were at some, they were somewhere together and they heard about um, a Shelby being sold, right? Mm -hmm. And no, two Shelbys, oh. that was the whole thing. And yeah. so they went to wherever this auction was happening for these two Shelbys. One of them was Steve McQueen's. The other was like a Shaw from you know, somewhere in the Middle East. Yeah. And he asked me which of those two, like if you could purchase one of those two cars, they were the same amount of money kind of a thing, like which one would you purchase? I said, well, you'd get the Steve McQueen car, sure. of course. He said, right. Nick Cage got the, he wanted the one that the this Middle Eastern like uh, Shaw had like driven around in like the desert. He's, he, he's, he wanted like, you know, the vibe of this sort of thing. So right. I know he loves cars. I like to think that maybe he still has the Stingray Corvette. I don't know, but when I listen to the commentary, which they did 10 years after, they did it in 99. He okay. still had it then. Wow, okay. So, but that's a long time from now, you know, yeah. I don't know. Does he still have it now? Who knows, 22 right. 20 years, years later? Sure. Yeah. yeah, I hope so. We should yeah. find out. If anybody knows if he still has it, let us know, please. Yeah, we do want to know. I do want to know, do yeah. Know. Um, so the film was ahead of its time. In what ways? And we've talked about a little, some of these already. Yeah, I mean, I feel like his acting is really the thing that the movie it, it's the piece that holds the movie together. And I, I really do encourage people to watch it. Um, you know, if you had not seen it, hopefully you liked it. It seemed like you... There's some, I mean, just like the reading of the alphabet, there are yeah. some wild moments in this. Yeah. And the read, like saying the alphabet, which they could have cut. Yep. They could have cut it down so it was like A through F. Right. But he left the whole thing in. It's so... And it gets more and more intense. And yes, there's a Mick Jagger moment. When yes. He, when he does his hands yes. behind his... You know, if you've ever seen Mick Jagger on stage, especially in the 60s and 70s, right? So it, it's it's a really it really is a very interesting performance. Um, I think that the movie is very funny. Uh, you know, it goes to dark places, and it's a bizarre film with a bizarre journey with a strange performance. But I think that that's part of the reason why it was ahead of its time. You know, it's it absolutely feels like a midnight movie, a cult film, right? Like that just didn't get its you know do at the time yeah and that acting i can't imagine you know honestly like if i was in my 30s or something and had seen that when it came out i feel like i'd be like what is this i don't know though but i was i was also somebody who saw his wicker man in the theater and loved it nobody else really liked it but i felt like i i don't know i felt like i got it mm -hmm. i thought it was funny <laughs> yeah well that almost segues to the next question mm -hmm. the next movie yeah so and so why I was thinking about this. And look, it, the next movie is going to be number three. And there's a number three right behind me. Yeah. Over here. See? Yeah. So the next movie is going to be number three. And there's a number three behind me. <laughs> Sharp. <laughs> it's so <laughs> fascinating. Uh, um, I was thinking about it last night. I So the first film we did, 2002, I was going to pick a later performance. But then I thought, well, I haven't done a 90s film yet. So yeah. I think I'll do 90s. Um, I think we should do my favorite film. The Rock. All right. I uh, love it. Yeah, which is, it's very different from these two films yeah. that we've, yeah, because that, that's also the other thing. I was going to pick a, a later film and I felt like maybe it's too thematically similar to what we're seeing. Yeah, let's go with The Rock. 
Yeah, and you want to talk about a range. Yeah. I mean, oh my, of of plot and story, you know, story plot and um, character. Well, right, and the budget like, alone for that yeah, film yeah. must have been way more than Vampire's Kiss and Adaptation put together. Yeah. I mean, You're right. Sean Connery is probably, you know, producing budget alone was like, who knows, dude? Right. I hear you. 25 million. All right. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do something a little different and we'll definitely get dinged on YouTube, but that's all right. If they want to monetize the song, we're fine with it. Um, we'll give up our fees. Uh, but I'm going to see if I can get my... We're going to listen to just a couple of tunes um, from the film. And this was by Colin Towns. Uh, I'd like to listen to Bat. Not in their entirety, of course. F segments of Bat. Because we did talk about the Bat. Tunnel Vision. And then Grease Hole. Grease Hole. Tell them what Grease Hole was, if you recall. No, dude. Grease oh, Hole? Oh, sitting in the... Uh, the diner and getting uh, irate because yes. it's taking too long to get served. <laughs> Call it a grease hole. Yeah. Yes. And so, of course, one of the tunes is called Grease Hole. Uh, that's right. Um, that's and right. apparently the score, as I as I read on the internet, a fabulous place, um, it was recorded in Budapest to save money. And so we're going to get Sean, is it, and knows a lot about scores, soundtracks and scores. We're going to get his impressions on this. Um, we'll cut it up a little, so give me, it'll be a second. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, this is my wife's speaker. I did get it to work this morning. Well, I'm excited. I know, right? It looks nice. Tooth, which I was kind of shocked because I'm not very skilled. In when you when wireless. you had this when you had this question on there, it actually reminded me that um, I thought I hadn't ever looked for the score. I don't oh, think, I don't, think I don't think that the f there's a physical release right. of it. Uh, you know, it would not surprise yeah. me. Yeah. Or this person just got it like. In Europe, someplace, or yeah, I'm sure you because it would be very hard to like manufacture it from the film because it's all segments. Yeah. Um. While he's prepping that, in case this uh, we need some outtakes, yeah. I can uh, highly recommend this this version if you're gonna get it. That's upside down. This Blu-ray by MVD Visual is very good. This company is good and uh, comes with a nice slipcase, some of it, and also comes with a nice fold-out poster. Oh. But the, uh, I thought that the quality was um, really good. I don't know if you can see that there. Nice little fun poster. Great cover. I love the fact they gave you a mini poster. Yeah, the mini poster is wonderful. And the uh, something I can hang up in this garage. Yeah. But the uh, the film is really good. I do I, I encourage people to check it out, even people who are just on the fence about Cage. I think it's a really it's an interesting movie to see. Okay. Let's check um, it out. Let me jam my fat face in one more time. Make sure the red dots are... Okay, good. That looks good. So let's see here. Um, I said we'd listen to if in my dream bat? of dreams, bat, tunnel vision, and grease hole. So let's see if we can start with. What's, oh yeah, so got some paint chip. Oh no, it's vampire tooth package. <laughs> I was like, what is that? Uh, so let's see. Bat. Oh. It works. This is not it. It's a YouTube ad. Ooh, that's a good sound. cut it there it's only a minute long and we did 30 seconds but we'll i love that for the first thing that comes to my mind is every time i'm listening to score music at the house and it's not in my headphones and my wife happens to be around she's like what is this how can you work with something like that like a sound like that in particular right because there's a lot of highs and there's a lot of lows right there'll be a lot of time where it's like rumbling very lowly you can't hear anything and something like this pops up you know startling terrifying yeah. but i don't know i find it enjoyable this is great um it sounds very reminiscent to me i'm assuming it was on purpose to like old silent film you know like overly orchestrated in a very like you know useful fashion i, I like that it's nice and the other thing that strikes me because we talked about the bat being mechanical uh -huh. earlier is that how the music 
because it's so robust, it's so big, it's so bold, if you have think that you even have a second to think about the bat being fake, that's playing. Yeah. So you don't. Yeah. It's completely. That's true. It, yeah. yeah. And the scene is not a particularly long one. As we no, it's about. very short. Yeah. yeah. And they do a good job of like, yeah, the music absolutely plays into that. The way that they shot it, really, I, we didn't really talk too much about the way that the film looks, but I thought that the film, for a very low budget film, they said the budget was under two million for this whole thing. Uh, that it looked really good. There's some really interesting shots, like some German like expressionistic mm -hmm. shots. And the music absolutely plays into like the way that uh, it worked well for a low yeah. budget film. And I think the two films that you were talking about earlier, which is Nosferatu yeah. and Cabinet of Caligari. If, yeah. if if you were wanted to be a super yeah. fan, to sit down and watch those and pay very close attention to the composition and the framing yep. and the lighting, and then sit down with our vampires kiss. And then start to make some absolutely some side to side comparisons. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, they're great comparisons for the acting style. I think it explains a lot for people who are don't get Nick Cage. You know, you can get a lot of where he's coming from from those two films. Um, but absolutely, yeah, you're right. The composition. There's some like really interesting shots in Vampire's Kiss that you feel like just aren't used today, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're like just shots like what we're using here. Yep. In the square. All right, so let's keep going. Okay. We have, that was bad, but we are not, we're going to do Grease Hole last, <laughs> so, so let's do, uh, I forgot about that, man. Uh, let's do uh, <laughs> Tunnel Vision next. There'll probably be an ad, or I have no service because I have Verizon in Los Angeles. This is not a big enough city. Well, the stock is bubbling in the park, we'll just the way to be changed. Favorite part of Vampire's Kiss. I do not know who that is. Yeah. Maybe we need to. Sh what is it called? Shazam. Shazam this song with another phone and see. Yeah, I wonder because like, well, you you recently gave me those call records and there's this great film that Paul Schrader did called Light Sleeper and I didn't know that that lead singer. What's his name? I don't know. He's got that it's great deep yeah, voice. Yeah. He did the whole soundtrack yeah. to and the whole reason I came to know him and had heard of that band was because of that. So I wonder like, is this guy Colin Towns? Yeah. Was he in a band? We're going to have to find out. Yeah. Or if you know, you can yeah. let us know. Yeah, comment and let us know, please. But the first time I heard this, I immediately thought two things. One, like, oh, Harold Fultemeyer is Esh, is that his name? Yeah, Fultemeyer, yeah. yeah. Was 50%. And then the other 50% was, of course, considering the, the date, 1987, yeah. New Order. Yeah. I mean, not that that's them. It's not. Right. But I'm talking about the nuances, the For sounds, sure. yeah. et cetera, the busyness of it, because it's busy. It is. It's great. Works great for that club scene, though. Yes. Yeah. Is that the one they use at the end club scene? Do you remember? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember either. I don't remember. But there's a couple club scenes that are really great, and that must be from that second one. But yeah, that's really good. I wonder if that's him. We're gonna have to find out. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah. Or if you yeah. know, let us know, please. Okay. So I said we'd finish with Grease yeah, Hole. Grease Hole. So let's do just that. I don't even remember music in this scene. Well, here it is. <laughs> After the commercial, I'm sure. short it's two that. minutes long that's but beautiful though yeah, yeah right yeah. it is beautiful really nice but uh, and also some of that made me think of like it sounds like bat it could be bat too yes also bat, bat as well well 
so I always, you know, I assume some some composition happens before, right? It sounded to me like this one happened after, right? Because they want to save money. So I, you know, sometimes if you're scoring to the picture already, you know, it's maybe that also kind of works to what this film was, right? Like it feels like an old Nosferatu silent film or whatever. So like if you're scoring to it, like they used to play live music along with the films, right, to accompany it. Maybe that played into how they com like composed this music. I'm not sure. Maybe they had the ideas before, but this kind of takes me through the emotional journey that his character is going through in this scene, right? Don't you think? Like yeah. the way that, that the music sort of builds and like, because yeah, he <laughs> loses his shit in the scene, you know? And it's, it's great. It's very reminiscent of that music. I can't remember if it's the beginning of losing the sh his shit or it's just part of the year because there's a lot of it. Yeah. There's a lot of it. It's hard. Yeah. To put a specific point on it or moment is probably hard. It is. Because it definitely feels like part of, I mean, part of the thing they did a wonderful job with this film, I yeah. think, is that over the course of time, it, he gets more demented, he gets crazier, yep. he gets more unpredictable, but it doesn't really, there's not like a moment. It's just, but as it d gets closer to the end of the film, it becomes amplified in a big, big, big yeah. way. Yeah, I think that they are very successful in con like continually raising those stakes, and it's very well done. I think you're right. Like it's, it seems kind of subtle at first. There's just like a random outburst here and there. They just start piling up, and they just get nuttier and nuttier. Like there's that great moment where he's walking out to confront Alva, and he just jumps on the desk. It's out of nowhere, he just jumps on this desk and points at her and like yells something at her and he's like chasing her. It's just like, there's something very like comical about it, right? And like Looney Tunes-esque and cartoonish and slapstick almost, you know? And it's just, But it works so well for this unhinged character. Both you and I work in offices oh. and we know that would never fly. Never, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, anyway, okay. Yeah. All right. So the only thing I want to do is because that one went down. Sure. I just want to. I'm going to move that over there. We're just going to random talk, oh. unrelated to, in case I just couldn't want to use sure. those shots. Um, so yeah, are you feeling good about this? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. You? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very okay. good. Okay. Like we got a lot. The music part's cool. Yeah, music's great. That's a great so addition. Let me kill this. Yes. Welcome to another episode of Cage. I could discuss Cage for hours.